Hello and uh, welcome to this live stream. Today, uh, my name is George and today we're going to be talking about the Crow manual, design manual for bicycle traffic. Now, I wanted to start with a bit about uh, how this is going to run and uh, my interest in this topic and, uh, and what, what we seek to accomplish here today. So, uh, first of all, uh, a, a bit about uh, what uh, the format is. And uh, today I'll just be going through one the the different chapters of the Crow Manual, and uh, and seeing what kind of uh, things that these design manuals as a type of document can say about uh, how we choose to design our streets. Um, and then two, we'll dive in into uh, chapter one and start a brief overview. Now uh, let me just transition through here. Aha, uh -huh. so I, I made a brief overview here. So this is just the, the chapter layouts uh, from the Crow Manual. And um, and as you can see, there's uh, there's actually eight sections. So I actually wanna do uh, eight different videos, uh, one per chapter. And uh, today we're talking about the development of bicycle traffic, which is the, the first chapter. Uh, chapter two, bicycle friendly design. Three, the basic data. So, so that's the data on uh, human dimensions, uh, the speed of cycling, um, and and the basic physical elements. Uh, three, the design of the cycle network. Uh, so that goes more into the the macro level. Um, five, the road sections. So how uh, the various uh, micro street design works. Uh, number six, the junctions. Seven implementation, eight evaluation management, and then finally there's uh, actually a chapter nine in there which has all the design sheets. Now, um, the, the reason I wanted to start with the table of contents is because I think uh, design manuals are are interesting. They they say not only something about how bicycle infrastructure should be designed, but they also say something about uh, the priorities that we put into the different elements of design. So um, actually here in, in my research, I'm looking at how the, uh, the various uh, design elements, um, sorry, one, one. <laughs> okay, so, so how uh, different design manuals, uh, whether they are fra from uh, traffic design uh, or to design manuals used in, uh, let's say urban lighting, uh, and design manuals used in urban design, what do they say about the ideology behind how we design our streets? So uh, I, I actually did a post here, uh, three playbooks for the American traffic engineer, where I looked at one extreme of how, uh, how design could be done. And this one extreme is that uh, we do design completely from, let's say, geometric design, right? So, uh, so here you have a vehicle, and with this vehicle, you have various dimensions. And with these various dimensions, let's say a vehicle that's five meters long and, and three meters wide, how do we design a, a road around these dimensions, right? Uh, and actually, Preiturch makes this argument, you know, most of us have long known, at least implicitly, that mobility and the street are political, right? So this is what I want to examine more in my research. Uh, those who don't drive know this better than anyone else, right? So the way we design streets is not value neutral and the way that design is being put into practice is also not value neutral for um, practitioners, right? So this is kind of what we're, we're going to look at. Um, another article here on bicycle design manuals as political technology, which I will also discuss, right? Um, so what, what kind of logic, what kind of thinking are these des design manuals uh, being involved in? And I think uh, once we start diving in, it'll become quite clear. Uh, I've looked at nine different manuals, so the Crow manual is one of them um, in my research, but I wanted to start with the Crow because it seems like the, the one that is, is rather um, uh, far ahead in the, this regard, it's more, um, it's less traffic oriented and more, let's say, social and, and urban design oriented. So, um, right, also bicycle infrastructure in a world of design, what does it mean? How do we apply design thinking to uh, bicycle infrastructures? And I think looking at the Crow Manual is a, is a good way to uncover at least how the, the Dutch uh, do this. Great, so let's uh, hop back in here onto uh, the Crow Manual. 
and uh, you know, I, and chapter one here is actually a, a development of the the history of bicycle traffic, right? Um, so, so the history of cycling in the Netherlands, as uh, as Paul mentioned in the in the live stream chat here, is that it's it actually took quite a long time for the Netherlands to get here, um, and it, it definitely did not happen overnight. And the, the design manual co-evolved with uh, the, the various uh, things that were happening uh, in the Netherlands, right? So, um, so cycling was, uh, was not as valued back in the 1970s. And, and that's when we saw more infrastructure actually being built. And the first dedicated bicycle design manual uh, in the Netherlands actually was, uh, was from 1993. Um, and in 1993, they came up with what's the manual? That came? Ah, sign up for the bike, right? So they said 1993 saw the publication of the first design manual for bicycle bicycle traffic. Sign up for the bike. Uh, they argued for a properly designed bicycle infrastructure. And when I was doing research in bicycle highways, it was really interesting to see that the the first um, bicycle highway experiments, so these were fully separated uh, bicycle paths, were in uh, in the 1980s. Uh, one was in The Hague, and then another one in actually uh, Tilburg. And it wasn't until the 1980s that these were uh, dedicated demonstration routes uh, that were developed. So it in terms of bicycle infrastructure, it, it hasn't been in the Netherlands forever. Uh, if you look back in the archival pictures um, and videos, black and white, um, the bicycle infrastructure didn't really exist until quite recently in the period of last 40, 50 years. So uh, before then, it was indeed uh, bicycle traffic mixed in with car traffic. Um, and, and you could see the streets all being just uh, pretty much uh, what we see in streets today in most other parts of the world is you have a, a, a sidewalk uh, for pedestrians and then uh, asphalt in the middle for, for cars. So actually the Netherlands went quite a ways into uh, making public space into, let's, let's, let's take for example, filling in canals in Amsterdam into traffic space uh, and also be using public squares as, as car car parking so that all happened you know before bicycle infrastructure became um, a, a key topic and it was interesting actually back in the uh, 1970s that despite uh, all of despite inaction I would say um, and and having a, just a, a normal uh, street design uh, and no bicycle infrastructure there was still quite a, a lot of uh, cycling and as you know there was the oil crisis in the 1970s which which actually got more people to ride the bike and that kind of increased awareness uh, including car free Sundays that um, that caused people to rethink the way that they get around so I'm actually I shouldn't be saying the C word because the YouTube has a algorithm thing but in these times right um, it's something similar to an oil crisis or something that is happening which drastically affects our mobility right so um so and then in in uh in 1.3 bicycle and government policy let's strip back here all right um this is interesting now um so as we look, right, this is from 1991 all the way to 2013. Um, the the proportion of motorists and cyclists have kind of uh, been quite level with each other, with cycling going up uh, slightly, but not too much. And uh, the proportion of, of motorists, this is in in terms of journeys, um, have been quite steady through all these years. So even though lots of bicycling dedicated bicycle infrastructure was being built, uh, as you can see from this chart, um, it, 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 has, it hasn't gone up that much for cycling. So there's another question. Hello, thank you so much for the stream. The first infrastructure in Tilburg and the Hay date from the second half of the 70s, in fact. Yes, there you go. Um, now, I thought it was interesting to look at this one, right? Because uh, at, at the Urban Cycling Institute, we do also um, do some research on uh, cycling and train as a as a combination mode. So it, it that chart was 
on bicycle distances traveled, uh, sorry, by trip. But if you look at by distances traveled, right, uh, cycling and the train are remarkably similar um, in, in terms of, of the percentage, right? So 14.5 uh, billion kilometers traveled by bicycle versus 17.7 .7 billion kilometers traveled by train. If you look at kilometers traveled, right, still the distances in, in the Netherlands uh, means that people are still driving over 70%. I think the number is closer to 80% of all, uh, all kilometers traveled. So in terms of movement, uh, automobile is still the dominant mode. Though uh, if you look at trips, right, cycling, it takes many more trips, but uh, the train then, uh, because of the longer distances it travels, uh, it, it looks like from kilometers traveled that the train is uh, supplementing, let's say, uh, cycling for, for those longer trips. And, and the question for you is, do you, uh, I wonder if the, there would be as many train trips, right, if there wasn't as many uh, cycling trips to, to complement. So very interesting, automobile still the dominant mode as of today, if you look at kilometers traveled, uh, followed by cycling, followed by train trips, and then uh, local public transport is, uh, it follows even that because those are relatively short distance trips and in uh, major cities. So um, there's some other cool charts in here that I want to cover. Uh, so here is a chart on the uh, various uh, distances that uh, are, are for different purposes, right? So uh, here, actually, the Netherlands keeps track of, uh, through various surveys, both recreation trips and, let's say, mandatory um, utilitarian trips. Uh, so here you have the different figures for, for work, uh, services, shopping, education, visit, stay, going for a ride or walk or, or other, right? And you can see here uh, on the 44% the in the middle, um, is, is education. So uh, that is the dominant mode of transport for uh, for people who, who get to school. And I think education also, it makes sense, skews towards the, the younger population, right? Um, and the younger population therefore takes more journeys uh, by bicycle. Also interesting fact here in the Netherlands, uh, if, you're, if you're Dutch, I think it's only for Dutch um, students for uh, high school and university, you get uh, free public transport all over the country. So, uh, so while that policy is aimed at giving access to education for for everyone who um, who lives uh, it, who lives further away from universities, the effect could be also that um, that policy by making public transits free could also be taking away from cycling and the short trips. So that that's uh, that's a very interesting category. Um, yeah, um, and then here we are looking at do, 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 what other is interesting here. The the lowest one um, here uh, going for a ride walk. That's that is not a purpose. Okay, shopping. Uh, people also go by bike for shopping, and uh, that indicates that. Uh, shopping trips are pretty close and and it's clear from this chart that it is indeed feasible and also the way that uh, grocery stores are, are laid out here in the Netherlands it's it's also very feasible to do shopping by bike right and that that's, might be one of the complaints where in countries where uh, shopping centers and grocery stores are designed in big packages for uh, in the store for automobiles uh, here the packages are smaller it's very feasible to do shopping by bike and um, and I think that that gives some insight about the reasons why. Okay, um, here is an interesting one. Uh, the development of the overall number of bicycles, right? Uh, you see Twitter going around that there's always, there's more bicycles than people um, uh, in this country. And indeed here it shows that uh, yes, people own more bicycles, but I think it's quite difficult to get an accurate count about uh, how many people own bikes in households. I mean, um, I, I have the suspicion that perhaps in the uh, in other countries, um, people still own these bicycles, but I would say that a lot of bicycles that people own are stashed in garages and attics and, and they're not very uh, functional, right? So I think um, the difference here in the Netherlands is that people own these bikes and 
perhaps most of these bikes are being used uh, on a regular basis. Uh, whereas in other countries, people may own these bikes for, let's say, a few trips during the, the year, um, but it is only for recreation, right? These, uh, the bikes here in the Netherlands, I suspect, quite, uh, quite well used. And also some people keep uh, two bikes, one at each end of the train journey. So you, you bike to the train station and then you leave the train station with bikes as well. So let's see. Um, Next, next thing is here, actually, this chart I wanted to talk about. It's about uh, e-bikes, um, the, the increased range of e-bikes, and that's actually a, a topic by quite a few practitioners uh, about what, uh, what benefits or, or downsides could there be for e-bikes, right? And this chart goes uh, to 2014, and you can see that this way. So you can see as a, the chart goes across, there's more e-bikes, but it's not that much of an increase. Uh, now I want to draw your attention. This is to the number of bicycles and e-bikes sold, whereas I just did some Googling and uh, and right now the the revenue generated, so, so the dollar amount, because e-bikes are much more expensive, uh, for these stores are actually oh, well over 50% of, uh, of the revenue for bikes that are being sold right um, so that's a that's a hot topic that's that's a new topic that's covered in this 2016 edition of the crow manual and um, and that is something that uh, that's some, that we should keep an eye on I think uh, as to how things are developed about the the differences between uh, highly urbanized versus uh, less urbanized areas right um, so in the Netherlands, this is a, a data set, I think it was a paper by, by Lucas Harms and, and a few other authors, where they look at uh, places that are very highly urbanized, highly urbanized, uh, moderately urbanized, less urbanized, and not urbanized. Uh, as expected, the, the places that are not urbanized, um, don't have as many cyclists, um, and uh, but what might be surprising is that the, the places are very highly urbanized, also isn't the place with the most cyclists, right? So the place with the most cyclists is actually up here on the on the top is actually the the highly urbanized. So not the dense urban cores, but the places where uh, where it's one level down from that. Um, very lively chats here. Thank you very much. Um, so this this chart is interesting, and it it suggests that perhaps there there is a level of uh, ideal density for for bicycling for cities, right? So we don't want to make cities that are too dense. Uh, that actually drives cycling away, perhaps due to mode shifts to uh, metros or, or walking because the distances are hyper close, but also as we move away towards uh, less density that then declines again. So you get a, a bit of a curve there, right? Okay, let's, uh, this is actually quite a short chapter. So, um, so let's look at uh, the next topic, which is recreation cycling, right? So recreation cycling, um, they, they, they say that the Dutch population cycles about uh, 820 kilometers per person per year, um, given the bicycle mode share of 7.2% in the total number of kilometers traveled, right? Um, and it says that 52% of the Dutch population, more than 8.5 million people, went on recreational bike rides of minimum of one hour. So in total, 205 million recreation rides were taken that year uh, in a population of uh, about, where are we, up to 18, 18 million now? Sorry. <laughs> so and it then talks about the, the different ways that, um, that this data is derived. Right, so actually, this is interesting. The uh, discussion on electric bicycles, and uh, and how that is also helping uh, people take recreation trips. Right, so today, before doing this live cast, I was out uh, uh, actually for a ride in the park, and uh, and I've seen quite a few older people out there doing uh, doing ri rides on their e-bikes uh, through these recreation trails and and all that. So. So I find that that quite interesting, being uh, viewed as uh, e-bikes being viewed as a commuting tool 
but also e-bikes being viewed as something that can encourage perhaps exercise, right? It's perhaps less effort to go the same distance, but because you can go further, uh, potentially there was just a new paper written on this that e-bikes could potentially actually result in a net gain in, um, in exercise. Okay. Let's see, let's go. Give me a moment. Great. And that is actually the final uh, topic in chapter one. So um, I'm going to try and respond to a few questions here, actually. Okay, Sebastian Merrick says In France, 400,000 e bikes have been sold last year in 2019, approximately 15% of the overall sales. From the levels in Belgium, the Netherlands, um, more than 40% now, if not mistaken. Oh, interesting. Um, so uh, the figure in the Crow manual only went up to 2013. Um, so I wonder if for Sebastian, these are also numbers that per unit sold, it's also catching up to being quite uh, up there. A, a, a quick Google, I think we could find out. Um, Sebastian, asked from before, how was decided the publication of the first handbook in 1993? Was it because the master plan came out in 1990? Do you know who sit on the panel if the crow? You know, that would be interesting. Uh, since we're all stuck inside, uh, I, I would love to actually do an interview as part of the series um, with the people who wrote the, the crow manual or who was on the committee. Um, so that is something that I will do. I'll reach out to a few of my contacts, see if uh, they want to do a live stream where, where they hop on Skype and, and perhaps I can ask them some of these great questions, right? Um, and then from before, right, so clarification on the, uh, the idea of separated back bike paths. Yes, so the idea of separated bike paths for recreation use also uh, dates way back into the the 1900s and um, and also uh, we we know from the places like the US they also had recreation back bike paths the California cycleway and such uh, that were completely separated from traffic uh, and that was at the beginning of the 1900s and I do want to clarify yes the separated bike path uh, what I mean by here is the modern separated bike paths that are in the middle of city centers Okay, um, wonderful. So um, that is all I have for chapter one today. Um, and and there are a few other things I want to cover. So I, I want to do some live casts on the rest of the chapters, one each. Um, I want to encourage you to uh, watch out for, if you have some time on your hands, uh, do the MOOC online, which is... Um, which is available on Coursera. Da -da. Great, there it is. So Unraveling the Cycling City. Uh, so if you're sitting at home, want some more in-depth uh, academic discussion, uh, hop on the Coursera, do Unraveling the Cycling City. Um, and we, we also do uh, some discussions on, on YouTube live chat within the course as well. Um, and the summer school is still April 1st. Uh, for for those of you who want to come to Amsterdam, that still should be going on uh, until I hear otherwise. And, uh, and if you like more stuff like this, both the live cast and other things, uh, hit like or subscribe and smash the button. And uh, I am kind of running out of voice here. So thank you everyone, uh, all 24 of you for joining this live cast. Um, and as I say, the, the next steps for this show would be to try and get some people on to interview. So if any of you actually want uh, to have an interview, a talk on, uh, on air, then definitely reach out to me. And also for those, um, who are interested in more in-depth ap academic discussions, um, I will look into perhaps holding um, discussions around ac academic papers as well. 
which would be fine. So thank you very much for joining me. I will sign off with this more video.